Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to FI 3004 Corporate Finance 2020. So this is the first lecture video of the course. Uh, before we get to the lecture, let me take this opportunity to introduce myself to you. My name is Hong Wu. I am a lecturer in finance. In Aberdeen, I am tasked with teaching finance modules such as corporate finance, financial management, and financial markets. So most of the time, I work with undergraduate students in their third year. My research interests are solvent risks, credit ratings, and corporate finance. Before you watch a lecture video, make sure that you familiarize yourself with the course teaching plan and assessment. All, these is, all the essential information about this module can be found in the course syllabus, which is available to students for students to download from my Aberdeen. Please remember that you will sit a multiple choice test after completing the first four topics of this course. The test consists of multiple choice questions plus two short answer questions. More information about the test and the materials for revision will be provided to students closer to the day of the test. The test will cover four topics cut, uh, taught by myself, including uh, fundamentals of portfolio theory, capital asset pricing model, debt financing, and cost of capital. These topics supply students the knowledge about the theories concerning risks in risky financial investment and tools to estimate the cost of capital which is an element of investment project evaluation in corporate finance. In the first four weeks of this semester, lectures will be delivered by me. If you have any queries, please send them to me by email. This week, we learned the fundamentals of portfolio theory. When students finish this lecture, they will have a good understanding of the concepts of risks and returns benefits of building portfolios of financial assets by diversification. Students are able to derive and interpret the capital market line. A thorough knowledge about the basic principles of portfolio theory supplied to students by this lecture will help students get ready for the second topic, the capital asset pricing model, which will be delivered next week. Before we discuss the principle of portfolio theory, it's necessary to learn several essential statistical concepts. They include holding period return of an investment, expected return, variance, standard deviation of returns, covariance, and correlation between two financial assets. Perhaps you may have heard about holding period return from other causes. Today, I reintroduce it to you. The main reason for reminding students of holding period return is that portfolio theory is built for risky investment for one holding period. A person might hold this financial, his financial asset for one day, one week, one month, or one year. Regardless of the investment horizon, each period for which asset is invested is one holding period. There are two components of one holding period return. Uh, the capital, capital gain or loss realized at the end of the holding period and all the intervening incomes received during the course of the holding period. Capital gain or loss is denoted by Bt minus B0 and incomes are denoted by D. In the specific case of common stocks, such incomes are paid in the form of dividends. So D also stands for dividends. At the beginning of the investment period, return is an uncertain variable, especially for such a risky asset like common stocks. So we treat return as a random variable 
with a certain probability distribution dictated by two statistical indicators, expected return and variance. Expected return is estimated by the investor based on his or her subjective belief about the probability distribution of return. It is the right measure of central tendency of a probability distribution for the purpose of portfolio theory analysis. Portfolio analysis. Uh, we have heard of other measures of central tendency like mean, median, mode, but the, uh, it has been shown that um, mean or expected return is the superior measure of central tendency of a probability distribution. Um, we don't have the space and the room for uh, proving why expected return is superior to mode and median, but we take it as given. Expected return is denoted by ER, which is the weighted average of all possible returns, RI, on the risky stock, with probabilities of each return is used as the weight. So I denote the weight as PI and the predicted return as RI. RI represents the return realized from risky common stock in a predicted scenario I. And PI represents the probability that the predicted scenario I comes true. So in a portfolio, uh, in portfolio analysis, expected return is one of the important inputs alongside variance and covariance, which will be introduced later on. The second input is the variance of return. We measure a risk associated with a risky asset by variance. Uh, which is a dispersion of uh, return around its expected value. Here I denote the variance with sigma squared, which is uh, sigma squared as uh, seen on the, dis on the display. Uh, looking at the variance formula, you can see uh, it is actually an expected value of square deviations of returns uh, from its expected value. So variant is useful in calculating the portfolio risk, but it is not it is not so convenient for presentation and interpretation. To make the task easier, when uh, especially for comparative comparison purpose, we have to create a more standardized measure of variance. So we create a second measure of dispersion, named the standard deviation of return, denoted by uh, denoted by sigma. So standard deviation of return is equal to the square root of variance. Sigma is measured on the same scale as return, so it is more convenient for comparing risks across risky measure, risky asset with standard deviation than with variance. Under the traditional portfolio theory, a probability distribution of return for a risky asset can be summarized by just two measures, expected return for central tendency and standard deviation for the dispersion, uh, degree of dispersion. We now, let, uh, let, um, we now go through a uh, small example to illustrate how expected return Variant and standard deviation are calculated with the raw input data. An investor, for example, set up her belief about the possibly possible um, about the possible outcomes of an investment in stock A, displayed by the table here. You can see that there are three predicted scenarios of the economy. An economy in a recession with a probability of 25%. Um, an economy in the sta a stable growth with a probability of 50%, and an economy in booming growth with a probability of 25%. The investor predicts that returns relies from the risky stock in recession is just 10%. 
it, uh, why the return might grow to 20% if the economy, economy grows at the stable rate. And he expects that the return will go, go up to 30% if the economy go, grows at the booming rate. So to work out the expected return, we multiply the predicted return in each scenario of the economy by its corresponding probability. Then add, we add up the products to find out the expected return. You can see here it is the sum of column P times R A, right? The sum is equal to point zero point two zero or twenty percent. Um to find the variance, we have to do a little bit more. Uh, we subtract the expected return of 20% from each predicted return. Then we get the deviation from expected return denoted by RA minus ERA. Uh, what we do next is to square, we square up the deviation from expected return and multiply it by the corresponding probability. The final step is to sum up the products. Then sum product, the sum product is displayed on the last column. Uh, the value display is 0 0.005, which is the variance of asset A. Um, to find the standard deviation, uh, we just do one extra step. Uh, Take the square root of the variance. Square root of 0 0.005 is 0 0.07. The standard deviation of risky asset A is 0 0.07 or 7%. Um, at times, the subjective probability distributions displayed in the in the table um, in the previous table are not available. Then expected return is estimated by a historical arithmetic mean return, and variance is estimated from the historical variance. Um, the, the, the screen shows you the formula for the arithmetic mean return, and the variance of return with, estimated with historical data. So we replace the expected return with a simple mean returns calculated on a historical return series spanning T periods in the past. We replace the variance with the average of square deviation from mean returns. Note that we take one unit from the denominator in this case as a matter of conservativeness as we are using a sample period of past return not the entire past return series. So take an example for the historical uh, data. This example shows you how to obtain mean returns and calculate the variance with historical data. Uh, mean return equals the sum of three returns in three years, 1991, 1992, and 1993, divided by three. We deduct the mean return, the RA bar, which is 0 0.2. We deduct 0 0.2 from the return of each year and square it up. You have, we have the numbers displayed on the last column, RA minus R bar squared. Um, the sum of this column represents the final outcome of the variance for risky asset A, not 0 0.01. And the very last step, obtain the standard deviation. Um, uh, we do that by taking the square root of 0 0.01, which is 0.1 or 10%. Okay. Um, next, we move to covariance and correlation. Uh, you will see later Later on, the implications of covariance and correlation for the effects of diversification on portfolio risk. By definition, the covariance measures the degree to which returns of two are set move together over time. 
For two risky assets A and B, for example, I call the covariance between A and B sigma AB. Sigma AB. As you can see here, there are three components under the sigma operator. RB minus ERB. This is the deviation of return on asset B from its expected value. The second component, RA minus ERA, is the deviation of return on asset A from its expected value. And the last component, PI, PI stands for the probability that RA, the return RA on asset A and return RB on asset B occur. So when the economy gets strong, return of asset A is higher than its expected value, and the same is true for return of asset B. Then the deviations of return from expected value will be a positive number for both asset A and B. When the economy grows, growth slows down or plunge into recession, return is lower than expected value for both asset A and B. The product of two negative deviation is a positive number. So if this core movement happens consistently, you will see that sigma AB becomes a positive number. When A is doing well but B is doing bad, you will see that deviation from expected return of asset A is a positive number, while the deviation of uh, return on asset B from its expected value is a negative number. The product of two deviation in this case is a ne negative number. If this trend continues consistently, you will see that sigma AB turns into a negative number. So covariance is very useful in the derivation of variance of a portfolio, and it plays a very a pivotal role in reducing the risk in a diversified portfolio. But it's not so convenient for interpretation and presentation. Uh, covariance prevents meaningful comparison across pairs of risky assets. The reason is that the magnitude of sigma AB not only depends on uh, return on asset A and asset B, but also depends on the variance of asset A and variance of asset B. So we have to create a second, a more standardized measure of um, core movement. This standardized measure of covariance is named the correlation. We create a correlation by standardizing the covariance. Correlation between asset A and asset B is denoted by rho AB. As you can see here, rho AB is correlation between A and B. It is equal to sigma AB divided by sigma A, sigma B. So on the numerator, you will see the covariance. And on the denominator, you will see the, the standard deviation of each individual asset. The interesting or an, an, an appealing feature of correlation is that correlation varies in the range between minus one and plus one. So it makes it easier and more convenient for investors to compare the degree of core movement between cross, across pairs of assets. When two assets core move in a perfect unison, then their correlation will be exactly plus one. There are some special cases which I think students need to remember. Firstly, the correlation of, uh, correlation of an asset with itself, it is always equal to plus one. Well, so secondly, the covariance of an asset with itself is actually equal to the, co to the variance of that asset. You can easily prove this statement. Sigma AA represents the covariance of stock A with itself. When you replace rho AA with unity, 
sigma i a is equal to sigma a square, which is the notation for the variance of stock a. So sigma a a is actually sigma a square. They are the same thing. When two assets are uncorrelated with another, row a b, both row a b and sigma a b are zero. The correlation and the covariance are zero for two uncorrelated assets. Okay, so we do bear that in mind. Um, let's take an example, another example. Uh, for example, A is negatively correlated with B. Rho AB is now equal to minus 0.35. We uh, have two risky assets with variance of asset A equal to 0 0.005 and variance of asset B equal to notch point zero two two five. Then the task the question is what is the covariance between stock A and stock B? So you can use the formula of for correlation to figure out the covariance between stock A and stock B by rearranging the equation for the correlation sigma A B becomes the um, Sigma A B equals is equal to correlation between A and B, rho A B times sigma, sigma A times sigma B. We replace sigma A with the standard deviation of stock A and sigma B with the standard deviation of stock B. Then rho A B in this case is a negative number. Sorry about the the typo. I correct it um, later on. Um, the row AB is negative notch point zero zero three seven. So in this case, so in this uh, in the second video, I'm going to show you what happens when um, we combine two risky assets in one portfolio. What would happen to the portfolio expected return and standard deviation? Then you will see, you will realize the logic of risk reduction by diversification. See you there in the second video. Thanks. Bye-bye.